good morning and welcome to the Department of State. Um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's my privilege to be able to begin this very important event, which is the announcement ceremony for the 2013 World Food Prize Laureate. I'm Bob Hormetz, I'm Under Secretary of State for Economic Growth, Energy, and the Environment. I'd like to particularly welcome uh, our Secretary of State, uh, Secretary John Kerry, who has devoted an enormous amount of energy and leadership over the years to the issues that we're going to be covering today and to the kinds of subjects that are the, uh, are the key central element of this World Food Prize. I also want to thank my old friend and colleague, uh, Ambassador Ken Quinn. We worked together for a number of years. He was the president of the World Food Prize Foundation. And a very warm welcome to Mr. and Mrs. John Ruan, sponsors of the prize. And this is a very important prize, and he has really kept his focus on this issue and his generosity and support are deeply appreciated by people in this country and around the world. Also a special welcome to members of the Congress who have joined us here today. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome the many ambassadors also who are in this audience. I see a number of ambassadors with whom I've worked over the years and representatives from the diplomatic corps throughout Washington and colleagues from other agencies of the US government, NGOs who play a very important role in the area of food and nutrition, uh, representatives of industry and policy research institutions as well. I want to thank all of you for honoring us today with your presence. I'd also like to thank the organizers of the World Food Prize for their efforts in highlighting the important contribution agriculture plays in economic development. This prize is extremely important because it recognizes individuals who have made remarkable contributions to improving the quality, the quantity, and the availability of food throughout the world. Uh, John Ruan, as an Iowa businessman and a philanthropist, and uh, his, as I say, his generosity and his commitment, his deep personal commitment to this is, in my view, exemplary and demonstrates the very best of what America has to offer to its own country and to the world. All of the people who are represented here, uh, who are engaged in this process, share a strong to reducing hunger and poverty around the world and these objectives are a very important part of the U.S. government's Feed the Future initiative. And there's one statistic that I think, in my mind, having gone around the world, seeing many developing countries from the time I was in graduate school, is that roughly one quarter, one quarter of all the children in this country, in this world, suffer from stunted growth because of malnutrition. One quarter of all the children in the world suffer from stunted growth due to malnutrition. This is something we all ought to bear in mind because it affects not only their childhood, but affects them throughout their lives. The malnutrition means that they attain less in terms of their ability to, to uh, develop uh, their brains, their cognitive ability. It <laughs> impairs their health throughout their lives. It diminishes their earning power. So providing for nutrition for younger people, particularly in their first thousand days, is critically important, not only for those first thousand days, but for the entire lifetime of those individuals. And these are among the most helpless among us, and they're the ones who we really need to keep our eye on, focus on, and do more to help. And this uh, is a very important part of the U.S. Feed the Future initiative, critically important. The United States continues through this initiative and others to be a strong leader in agricultural science and technology. From our early support for the Green Revolution, led by Dr. Norman Borlaug, who was the founder of the World Food Prize, to our successful application of new innovative agricultural technologies today. These achievements renew our commitment to inspire a new green revolution. And that revolution will reverse, if it's successful, and we believe it will be, will reverse the global trends of poverty, hunger, and undernutrition that still exist in many parts of the world. So I regard this, and I think all of us here regard this, as a very important subject as human beings, as moral people, as people who are concerned about 
the future of young people and the future of our world, the issue of, of malnutrition, the issue of food supplies, food security, has to be very high on our international agenda and is, in fact, a very strong commitment of the United States. And Secretary Kerry has played a very key role in this. So now I would like to introduce my friend, my former colleague, Ken Quinn, who is the president of the World Food Prize. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Well, Secretary Hormatch, thank you so very much for the warm welcome and all our past collaboration. Uh, Secretary Kerry, uh, on behalf of our chairman, John Ruan III, his wife Janice, my wife Lay Sun, our Council of Advisors, I want to extend to you our heartfelt thanks uh, and appreciation for presiding at this event and you're continuing a 10-year tradition that began in 2004 when Secretary Colin Powell first hosted our laureate announcement ceremony. I'm so glad all of you could be here today with us. And we're deeply grateful to have the privilege to announce our winner each year of our quarter million dollar prize here in such a prestigious setting. Now the World Food Prize, you may not know that we're uh, located in Des Moines, Iowa, and so we're very pleased that we have with us today, representing our congressional delegation, Senator Tarm Harkin. And Senator, thank you. What, 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 what an incredible great friend you have been to the World Food Prize and we thank you so much for all that you've done. And, and Mrs. Barbara Grassley, Senator Chuck Grassley's uh, wife is here. And Mrs. Grassley, thank you for being here with us and please, please tell the Senator that we send our very best and our appreciation to him. And the uh, former Congressman Jim Leach uh, and former chairman of the uh, National Endowment of the Humanities is here. Jim, thank you so much for being here. And another Iowan, you, yeah. You, you, I, I think you're beginning to see there's so many Iowans around. Another Iowan, Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack usually is here, uh, but he had a conflict today. I saw him yesterday. He asked me to be sure and convey his greetings and asked me to tell you about the Wallace Carver internship which is a wonderful part of our youth program for high school and college age students. We have 19 of our Wallace Carver interns who we partner with USDA with. They're here someplace. Wave your hands so people can see you. Here. All right, there they are. So ambassadors, uh, members of the diplomatic corps, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, right across the street is the building of the National Science Foundation. And in the beautiful rotunda there is an inscription that states that science is the multiplier of the harvest. And the founder of the World Food Prize, Dr. Norman Borlaug, received the Nobel Peace Prize and was called the father of the Green Revolution because he was a multiplier of the harvest using science. And I'm so pleased his granddaughter, Julie Borlaug, could be here today. Julie, where are you? Thank you for being here. Now, with the support of the Ruan family over the past 27 years, the World Food Prize that Dr. Borlaug started has grown to be recognized as the Nobel Prize for Food and Agriculture. And our laureates come from a wide array of countries and achievements and uh, all around the globe. And they are also multipliers of the harvest. And I want to recognize Dr. Hans Herren from Switzerland, one of our laureates is here, and David Beckman. So thank you and for being here. And uh, as well as Peter McPherson from our Council of Advisors. Now, to announce this year's recipient, it's important to note that 2013 represents the confluence of two significant scientific anniversaries. It will mark the beginning of our year-long Borlaug Centennial Observance, which will celebrate the 100th anniversary of the birth of Dr. Borlaug, and it's also the 60th anniversary of the discovery of the DNA double helix. And in referring to the double helix, the chairman of the World Food Prize Selection Committee, Dr. M. S. Swaminathan of India, stated that, quote, during the last 60 years, the science of molecular genetics, also referred to as new genetics, has opened up uncommon opportunities for shaping the future of agriculture, industry, medicine, and environment protection, end quote. 
or as Dr. Borlaug liked to put it, we're going from the green revolution to the gene revolution. Now, given these two anniversaries, our selection committee determined that it would be most appropriate this year to recognize some of the pioneers of the new genetics. And they have therefore chosen three distinguished scientists to share the 2013 World Food Prize for their independent, individual breakthrough achievements in founding, developing, and applying modern agricultural biotechnology. Now working in separate facilities on two continents, each conducted groundbreaking molecular research, and after countless hours in the laboratories, each discovered the key to plant cell transformation using recombinant DNA. And their work led to the development of a host of biologically and genetically enhanced crops that are now grown on 170 million hectares by over 17 million farmers worldwide. Over 90% are small, resource-poor farmers in developing countries who are now able to grow crops with improved yields, resistance to insects and disease, and tolerance against extreme variation in climate. Our new laureates have truly used science to multiply the harvest. It's therefore my great honor to announce that the recipients of the 2013 World Food Prize are Dr. Mark Von Montague, the founder and chairman of the Institute for Plant Biotechnology Outreach at Ghent University in Belgium, and from the United States, Dr. Mary Dell Chilton, founder and distinguished fellow of Syngenta Biotechnology, and Dr. Robert T. Fraley, the Executive Vice President and Chief Technology Officer of Monsanto. And, and, and I'm so very pleased that His Excellency John Matheson, the Ambassador of Belgium, could be here with us today for this announcement. And uh, so, Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much. Now each year we make public the names of our new laureate here and then the prize is presented in October in Des Moines at a ceremony at the magnificent Iowa State Capitol which has been called the Academy Awards of Agriculture. Yeah, I like that line. Yeah, sir. Yeah. And we do, I wish I had thought of it. We do this in conjunction with our Borlaug Dialogue International Symposium which draws over a thousand participants from more than 65 countries around the globe. And in keeping with the background of our laureates and Dr. Borlaug's anniversary, the title for our 23 symposium is The Next Borlaug Center Biotechnology, Sustainability, and Climate Volatility. Now today, another Iowan, Dr. Jim Yong Kim, president of the World Bank. You didn't know he was from Iowa, did you? <laughs> <laughs> He's from Muscatine. This, the same place that uh, President Xi Jinping calls uh, sort of a second home. And that, but the World Bank issued a report on the potential drastic impact of changes in the climate that could flood cities and affect huge areas of cropland, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. And World Bank officials have expressed the hope that advances in crop science and genetics will produce drought-resistant varieties of corn and other plants. And these are exactly the kind of achievements our laureates have made and continue to make. And our goal is to debate whether and how biotechnology can be engaged in the struggle not only to increase yields and ameliorate the perverse impact of dramatic climate variations, but also play a critical role in ensuring that agricultural and environmental sustainability are maintained. And we're going to have a distinguished and diverse array of speakers. His Excellency Olafur Ragnar Grimson, the President of Iceland, is coming to deliver the keynote. His Eminence, Cardinal Peter Turkson of Ghana, who's the President of the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace at the Vatican, is coming. And I have a very special announcement I'm able to make today. We're greatly honored that Tony Blair, Prime Minister of Great Britain and Northern Ireland from 1997 to 2000, and now patron of the Africa Governance Initiative, will be part of a special panel titled 40 Chances, organized by Howard G. Buffett and focused on redefining the fight against hunger, poverty, and suffering. And I'm so pleased that 
Howard W., his son, and his wife Lily are, are here today. We're, oh, they're all right. There they are over there. Okay, thank you so much. And, and, and please tell your dad, uh, of course, we send our best to him. And so I cordially invite all of you to come to Des Moines October 16, 18, to get one of these brochures as you leave, as we present the World Food Prize and convene what's been called the premier conference in the world on global food security as we begin the next Borlaug century. Now, one of the greatest privileges any Foreign Service officer can have is to introduce the Secretary of State. In this case, it's even more meaningful for me since my career intersected with then Senator Kerry back in the 1990s. I saw his political courage and leadership as we endeavored to account for all of the POW MIAs who had not returned from the Indochina War. We sat together at my residence in Phnom Penh and talked about, and I witnessed his commitment to confront terror for human rights as we worked to ensure that the genocidal Khmer Rouge could never return to power in Cambodia. And I saw his passion for alleviating human suffering as we shaped programs to uplift the Cambodian people who had suffered so much. So it's with immense pride, respect, and admiration that I introduce to you the Secretary of State the Honorable John Kerry. Can <clears throat> excuse me, thank you very, very much. Welcome everybody to the Franklin Room, to the State Department, and to this wonderful uh, celebration of creativity commitment, audacity, all at the same time. And I'm particularly grateful uh, to be introduced by Ken Quinn. Uh, I was sitting there thinking, uh, listening to Ken, you know, General MacArthur said, old soldiers never die, they just fade away. Well, old Foreign Service officers never die either, but they don't fade away, obviously. <laughs> they just go on to take on new terrible tasks, and this is a man who knows how to do it. I. Uh, what an amazing, uh, honestly, what an amazing journey we, we have shared together. Uh, a great deal of it uh, together, but some of it hidden. We didn't even know it. Uh, he, he was sitting there a moment ago and he said, did you ever get to Shadek? Uh, I think that's the way we pronounce it anyway. And, and uh, I said, yes, I did. And back in 1968, when I was in Vietnam, I, I got up to this tiny little hamlet on the Mekong River Beautiful, beautiful little place. Rice paddies all around it and everything. It's really wonderful. And Ken was informing me that he spent a whole year there or so, I guess, as a foreign service officer and actually going out on missions with some of our boats and so forth. So we've been intersecting for a long time and it's an honor to be here with him. Ken is the only foreign service officer <clears throat> to receive, receive both the Army Air Medal and the State Department's Medal for Heroism and And that tells you a lot, folks. Uh, he <clears throat> he went on to become the State Department's leading expert on the Pol Pot regime uh, and the widely acknowledged, really, as the first person anywhere to report on the genocidal Pol Pot regime's uh, initiatives. And as he mentioned, we had the privilege of working together on the PLW MIA issue, which I have to tell you, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, that was viewed as one of those impossible missions, not unlike the effort to end poverty or reduce hunger or eliminate hunger. Uh, and Ken, uh, who already had gone out to the dangerous places, took on this mission also when he was in Hanoi. And I think the words uh, impossible and intractable sort of go with his DNA somehow, and he knows how to work through them. Nobody could have imagined that John McCain, <coughs> John Kerry, uh, Bob Kerry, Bob Smith, and a bunch of others, Tom Harkin, the whole group, could come together and find a common ground despite different ideologies uh, and actually wind up making peace with Vietnam. And 
I think equally people could never have imagined a, a day when a guy named Ken Quinn could actually negotiate uh, the ability of Americans to go back into villages only 20 years after a war and go into prisons and search for American POWs in 1990s, uh, secure the rights for helicopters to come again with Americans in them out of the sky and land in hamlets unannounced to determine whether the truth had been told about prisoners of war. It was a remarkable experience, a remarkable period. And I mention all of this because right now he is really doing on hunger what he's done all, all his life is take on what are perceived to be these impossible missions, but what in truth, I think, uh, actually do have solutions. And that's what he is trying to prove. Uh, I wanna thank the generosity and the vision of John and Janice Ruan for their role. This award would not be here, and this, this impetus, this inspiration uh, wouldn't exist if it wasn't for their commitment and their generosity. Uh, and no surprise, folks, <clears throat> uh, it all begins in Iowa, which some of us know a lot of things begin in Iowa. Uh, I, uh, I think I put in enough days in Iowa to qualify as an Iowa citizen. So I, I too come from Iowa. Uh, not just, not just uh, Norman Borlaug and Ken Quinn and the others here. And, and I shouldn't be astonished by it at all. Uh, you know, it's, it's the place of one of the greatest movies, obviously, Field of Dreams, which we love, which I visited and got to hit a baseball in and run around and dip my finger into the corn. Uh, but I learned just now from Ken uh, that uh, Norman Borlaug not only was responsible for the Green Revolution, but here is the documentation, folks. This is from him. He is responsible for the lifting of the curse of the Bambino and the Red Sox won <laughs> because Norman Borlaug threw out the first pitch and exorcised the demons from Fenway Park. We are eternally grateful. So, uh, I have special gratitude today. Um, I also want to thank Mike my classmate, Tom Harkin, uh, for being here. There is no more dedicated uh, individual to the cause of human uh, aspirations and to eliminating human suffering than Tom Harkin. Uh, he has passed the granddaddy of legislation of the last years when you think of social legislation, the Americans with Disabilities Act. He is the father of that and the leader of that, and he puts his considerable skill to the task of making sure we address this concern of hunger. So Tom, thank you, and Barbara, thank you for being here on behalf of Chuck, uh, who we all expect will continue to be as irascible as ever, is that correct? <laughs> and I wanna thank you uh, for coming, and Jim Leach, thanks so much for coming and being here, former Congressman. Um, I do have special memories of Iowa, and uh, I learned, frankly, how to measure the passage of time by the height of the corn and the color. Uh, and I knew, yeah, I really did. I spent enough time there to be able to give you a lecture on agriculture and tile farming and a whole bunch of other things. But I did come to have this remarkable, healthy respect for our family farmers and for farming and for our ability to feed the world. And so, uh, all of you who've come here to celebrate this, this is gonna be much more important than just today. And I wanna thank the uh, colleagues from civil society and those of you from the 10 different agencies that are involved in these initiatives, all of whom come here and uh, do this under the leadership of uh, USAID. As, as was remarked by Ken, this is the 27th year of the World Food Prize and, and it will be officially awarded in Des Moines. Uh, I join in congratulating uh, each of the winners, Mark Van Montague, Mary Dell Chilton, and Robert Fraley for their pioneering efforts and their tremendous contributions to biotechnology and to the fight against hunger and malnutrition. And 
we obviously have a, uh, you know, it's hard as I think about it today. And I'm learning this more and more as I serve in these early months as the Secretary of State, having made the transition after 29 years in the Senate. Um, this connect between things that really matter to people on this planet uh, and the amount of time that is consumed talking about things that don't make that much difference. And the challenge today to all of us in a world that is facing the threat of climate change, which is more real than unfortunately some people want to acknowledge, and what that may do to hunger and refugees and devastation and to food supplies. Uh, these, are, these are really challenging times and this is a significant moment, which is why I said a moment ago, more than you know in terms of the future. Because despite all the world's technological advances, today nearly 870 million people, one-eighth of the world's population, suffer from chronic hunger, chronic hunger. And uh, it is obviously a trap that prevents people from realizing their God-given potential, but more than that, places people in extremis, places communities in extremis. It can actually feed into terrorism. It feeds into failed states. It feeds into all of the challenges that we face in terms of order and creating stability on this planet. And the struggle for food is, in the end, a struggle for life itself. So the stakes are really high. And the challenge is beyond what we face today in terms of all of these statistics and what they tell us. The challenge is that by 2050, the world's population is going to grow to 9 billion people. That is going to demand at least a 60% increase over our current agricultural production. We also live, as I mentioned earlier, on a planet that with respect to that agricultural production is increasingly strained by the changes that are taking place, the movement of the ability to grow from one place to another, literally. Ask something as apolitical as the Audubon Society about what their members tell them about whole swaths of America where things that used to grow no longer grow or species that used to exist no longer appear. President Obama, I'm pleased to say, understands this challenge. And as he has said, combating hunger is a moral impeditive. And when he took office, he put food security at the forefront of the development agenda. And, and I think he laid out a very bold plan for all of us to try to address this challenge. He has rallied global leaders to reverse the three-decade decline in agricultural investment. And he's put forth new initiatives like Feed the Future, which instead of giving out food, seeks to empower people in agriculture with the skills and resources to be able to improve their lives and produce food. Through Feed the Future, we are making progress. We're mobilizing resources to combat malnutrition in children, especially during those pivotal first thousand days of the start of a woman's pregnancy until the child has second birthday. As a result of those efforts, two million kids will now not be stunted in terms of their growth and development. Last year, President Obama, along with African leaders, announced the formation of the New Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition. And that is a way to seek to engage the private sector. And it has a goal of lifting 50 million people out of poverty in the next 10 years. And in, in just the first year of its existence, it has already earned 4 billion in investment commitments. And just, you can already see what this is doing uh, in Ethiopia, where I was just a few weeks ago for the African Union 50th anniversary. There, they are distributing uh, better seeds to about 15,000 maize farmers, and that will potentially increase their productivity by 50%. Uh, so 
obviously, we have to continue efforts like these. We have to grow existing efforts. We 